Hello, my name is Tamim Nazif, and I'm an interventional cardiologist at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. I'd like to begin by thanking the editors of the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery for the opportunity to speak. I'll be discussing recent advances in our understanding of TAVR-related cardiac conduction disturbances, including their incidence, clinical impact, and management. These are my disclosures. As the TAVR field has matured over time, improvements in our transcatheter heart valve devices, as well as our procedural techniques, have resulted in decreases in many important procedural complications. Conduction disturbances, however, remain the most frequent complication of TAVR. And these include both high degree atrioventricular block or other Brady arrhythmias requiring permanent pacemaker and new onset left bundle branch block. The relatively high incidence of these conduction disturbances after TAVR is believed to be due to both the high frequency of comorbid conduction system disease in patients with AS, as well as the close anatomic proximity of the aortic valve and the conduction system. And that anatomy is shown here. The bundle of His arises from the AV node low in the right atrium and courses behind the membranous septum before piercing through to the left side of the heart to give rise to the left bundle. And the membranous septum lies immediately beneath the trigone between the right and non-coronary cusps of the aortic valve, proximal to the distal landing zone of the transcatheter heart valve. And this close proximity renders the conduction system susceptible to injury during valve implantation. And elegant autopsy studies have shown the mechanisms of injury to include things like direct compression, hemorrhage or hematoma, and ischemic injury or inflammation. Atrioventricular block is primarily a periprocedural phenomena. It occurs most frequently at the time of the procedure within the first 48 hours. However, so-called delayed AV block can occur in up to two to 10% of patients. This is primarily concentrated within the first week, but occurs with a residual hazard out to about 30 days. New onset left bundle branch block also occurs predominantly at the time of the procedure, but has been actually shown to resolve in the majority of cases both within the index hospitalization and out to about 30 days, after which time the rate remains relatively constant. The indications for pacemaker implantation after TAVR have been well studied for all of the available transcatheter heart valve systems and shown to be high degree atrioventricular block in the majority of cases, 60 to 80%. However, this means that anywhere from 20 to 40% receive a pacemaker for indications other than high degree atrioventricular block, things like six sinus syndrome, bifascicular trifascicular block, or even left bundle branch block. It has also been observed across multiple data sets, in this case from REPRISE-3, the clinical trial, that only about half of patients who receive a new pacemaker after TAVR are dependent at follow-up of 30 days or one year. And the observation that patients receive pacemakers in some cases for indications other than high degree atrioventricular block and that not all patients are dependent at follow-up has led to important interest in ways to reduce unnecessary pacemaker implantation after the TAVR procedure. This remains an important area of investigation. With respect to the incidence of new pacemaker after TAVR has been well studied, particularly with the early generation systems. It was understood that the rates were lower with the original balloon expandable valves, about six to six and a half percent, and higher with the early generation self-expanding system, about 25 to 28 percent. These rates have clearly evolved over time. This is data from the pivotal and regulatory trials, as well as recent analyses from the TVT registry, showing that with the introduction of the newer generation Sapien 3 balloon expandable valve, there was initially an increase in pacemaker requirement. This was subsequently believed to be due to differences in implantation technique with the system and a learning curve. And the most recent data from the Partner 3 trial, as well as the TVT registry analysis, show rates similar to the early generation valves of about six to six and a half percent. There have also been changes over time with the self-expanding system. This is again data from the regulatory trials, as well as the TVT registry, showing that with the introduction of the newer generation Evolute R and Pro valves, it's been a meaningful decrease in permanent pacemaker implantation rates to about 11 to 20%. This is data showing the rates of pacemaker implantation after TAVR with other newer generation transcatheter heart valve systems. We see rates that are somewhat lower with the accurate NEO, less than 
and somewhat higher from 10 to about 20% with the Lotus Edge and Portico valve. But even with these newer generation systems, we see that this is a persistent problem. New onset left bundle branch block after TAVR occurs even more frequently than atrioventricular block, but occurs with the same general pattern. We see with the early generation valves, rates that were lower with the balloon expandable system in blue and higher with the self-expanding system shown in red. Data is relatively limited for rates of left bundle branch block with the newer generation systems. However, I would point out that in the recently released Partner 3 low-risk trial, patients who were treated with TAVR with the Sapien 3 valve had an incidence of new left bundle branch block of more than 20%. This shows that even in the lowest risk patients with the newest generation valves, this remains again a persistent problem. And why do we care so much about these conduction disturbances after TAVR? It's because multiple data sets have now shown that these conduction disturbances are associated with adverse clinical outcomes. This is data from a recent meta-analysis showing that new left bundle branch block in particular is associated with all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and permanent pacemaker at one year after TAVR. Although the situation is somewhat more complicated for permanent pacemaker, the data does suggest that pacemaker is associated with late mortality as well as heart failure hospitalization. Now that data was mainly from high-risk patients at limited follow-up of one year, but concerningly in this recent analysis of intermediate risk patients from the PARTNER2 trial at two years, we see that new onset persistent left bundle branch block was associated with a near doubling of all-cause mortality, as well as cardiovascular mortality at two years after TAVR. This shows again that even in relatively lower risk patients, at longer term follow-up, these conduction disturbances are associated with adverse outcomes. And we note that these curves continue to separate over time, indicating a persistent hazard. The exact mechanism by which new left bundle branch block translates into an increase in mortality remains unclear. One possibility is through the association with sudden cardiac death, which has been shown particularly when with a QRS greater than 160 milliseconds. Another possibility is through an increase or worsening of heart failure and multiple data sets, including this analysis from the partner trials have shown that conduction disturbances, especially left bundle branch block are associated with a decrement in left ventricular systolic function at long-term follow-up after TAVR. It's also likely that there will be long-term complications of conduction disturbances, including both left bundle branch block and pacemaker that have not yet been observed in the TAVR literature due to relatively limited follow-up. We knew, know from the EP literature, for example, pacemaker is associated with late hazards of device infection, pocket erosion, lead failure. We worry about other complications like tricuspid regurgitation, need for generator change, et cetera. And so I think these are not benign uh, uh, complications and need to remain an important focus of attention. Now, there have been also important recent advances in the management of TAVR-related conduction disturbances. I would point those clinicians interested in this topic to this recent JAK Scientific Expert Panel, which publishes an algorithm for the management of these patients. This begins with the pre-procedural risk evaluation for conduction disturbances, which may modify our procedural care of the patients. Early on in TAVR, the uh, prediction of conduction disturbance was relatively limited, including simply things like the type of transcatheter heart valve, depth of implantation, perhaps right bundle branch block for pacemaker. However, over time, multiple investigations have revealed multiple additional risk factors for conduction disturbances after TAVR. These can be broadly divided into the following categories, clinical and demographic features, baseline EKG findings, especially pre-existing right bundle branch block, which has been the most potent identified predictor of pacemaker. Important new anatomic risk factors, which have increasingly been recognized with the advent of routine CT planning of TAVR procedures. These include factors like the membranous septum length, calcium burden and location, annulus or LVOT area, and ellipticity. There's also been recent attention to potentially modifiable procedural risk factors. These include the choice of transcatheter heart valve system, depth of implantation, THV sizing, and in particular, oversizing relative to the annulus or LVOT, 
and the use of pre or post balloon dilatation. And recently there have been efforts to, uh, to develop predictive models that allow us at the time of the initial pre-procedural evaluation of the patient to determine the risk for conduction disturbances, including pacemaker. And this can be very useful in the management of these patients. I wanna also call attention to the recently published MIDAS study. This is an example of the use of some of these new predictors of conduction disturbances to modify our procedural conduct. In this case, the difference between implant depth and membranous septum length was shown in a retrospective cohort to be important in predicting pacemaker. And it was shown with a repositionable valve system that taking into account the length of the membranous septum and trying to implant valves higher in those with uh, short membranous septum lengths led to very low pacemaker rates in the low single digits, in fact. This requires uh, reproducing in larger uh, patient populations, but may represent an important step forward in this uh, area. We've also learned a substantial amount about the post-procedural management of these patients, and I think it's important to uh, manage these patients in a consistent, evidence-based fashion. This Jack Scientific Expert Panel offers one such algorithm, and other algorithms have been published. In this algorithm, TAVR recipients are separated into five groups based upon EKG findings, both pre-procedural and post-procedural. Those patients with no EKG changes after the procedure and no pre-existing right bundle branch block have been clearly shown to be at very low risk for dangerous conduction disturbances. These patients are therefore ideal for a minimalist approach and expedited recovery and early discharge clinical pathways. On the other hand, certain higher risk patient subsets have been identified. These include four groups, those with pre-existing right bundle branch block, EKG changes, including PR or QRS prolongation, new onset left bundle branch block, and observed high degree AV block. These are patients for which there are recommendations for enhanced monitoring and permanent pacemaker implantation in the appropriate patients. The value of the post-procedure EKG should be emphasized. Again, it's been shown that delayed high degree AV block can occur up in up to two to 10% of patients. However, this has been shown to be very uncommon in patients with normal or unchanged EKGs in the absence of preceding right bundle branch block. And it's been shown that both the absolute value as well as the change or increase in QRS and PR duration are important. These patients with changing, evolving EKGs are clearly a high-risk subset. The other high-risk groups, as I mentioned, include baseline right bundle branch block. This has been associated with an increased risk of mortality after TAVR, which may be attenuated in appropriate patients by pacemaker implantation. New left bundle branch block has also clearly been shown to be a high-risk patient set as described, and the risk of bradyarrhythmic events seems to be concentrated in the early post-procedural period extending out to about 30 days. This raises the question of whether enhanced monitoring of these patients during this period might be warranted. And so again, we recommend careful attention to these higher risk patient groups. And these are patients where consultation with the electrophysiology team is probably appropriate. There may be recommendations for extending the uh, duration of temporary pacemaker, uh, additional monitoring, electrophysiology study, and finally pacemaker in the appropriate patients. And it's recommended that the indications for pacemaker implantation should be guideline-based, given the observation that not all pacemakers are placed for high degree atrioventricular block, and that not all patients are pacemaker dependent at follow-up. And so I'll conclude there. I hope I've demonstrated that conduction disturbances, including new left bundle branch block and pacemaker, remain a frequent and important complication after TAVR, one that is clearly associated with adverse outcomes, including mortality, specifically with new onset left bundle branch block. Clinicians should pay careful attention to modifiable predictors of conduction disturbances, including things like device selection, depth of implantation, oversizing, balloon valvuloplasty, and so on. There have been important recent advances in management of conduction disturbances after TAVR, 
I recommend that we familiarize ourselves with the Jack Scientific Expert Panel or other similar published algorithms and manage these patients in a consistent fashion with very careful attention to the high risk groups and that we follow guideline based indications for pacemaker implantation. I thank you very much for your attention.